guess what you're listening to right now. Go ahead. We'll wait. Believe it or not, you are listening to a recording from the first Jewish place of worship in our nation's capital. Let's rewind. Now, Adath Jeshurun is not actually the first synagogue in Canada. No, that honor goes to Emmanuel in Victoria, British Columbia, whose building dates to 1859. And the oldest congregation in Canada is the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue of Montreal, which was established in 1768. So the synagogue we are looking at is not the oldest synagogue, nor is it the oldest congregation in Canada, but it is the oldest synagogue and the oldest congregation in Ottawa, Ontario, and that is no small feat. Hello, I'm Lawrence Wall. Our history is our treasure, treasure that we keep in a humble, bursting at the seams archive at the Jewish Federation of Ottawa. Archives can seem inaccessible, but with this podcast, we're bringing the archives to you. Honoring the past is one of the 613 commandments or mitzvot of Judaism. 613 is also the area code for Ottawa, the capital city of Canada, a city that hosts a vibrant historical Jewish community. 613 Archives is where we dig into the shelves and drawers of the Ottawa Jewish Archives for stories that bring our past into the present. Thank you for joining this dig. And now, here's your host, Jimmy Gutman. It sits at 375 King Edward Avenue. And, in the past, it looked quite different. Today, King Edward is a wide street. Three lanes north and three lanes south through the middle with a median with small trees. In some ways, this is the traditional border of the city. The French on the east, English on the west. If you start from the highway and drive north, you'll pass the University of Ottawa. Then you descend Sandy Hill and come to an intersection with Rideau Street, Ottawa's most iconic commercial street. In the past, Friedman's department store, owned by the founders of Adas Jeshurun, would be to your west. If you look at it now, you'll see the Hudson's Bay. Directly across is Ottawa's biggest mall, the Rideau Centre. To your right, if you look east, the iconic Bytown Theatre, shawarma shops, the Rideau Centre. When I was a child, it was always called King Street Shul. And I didn't know why it was called King Street Shul, because it was on King Edward Avenue. So why would they say King Street? That's Anna Bilski. She's the great-granddaughter of Moses Bilski and A.J. Friedman and the former president of the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society. She really cares about Ottawa Jewish history. And then I went to the Bytown Museum, and there's a map of the city in 1900 or somewhere around there, and it's King Street. And so when the shul was built, it must have been King Street. And, and King Edward Avenue was a boulevard, and it was supposed to be the major, the major, the Champs Elysees of Ottawa, right? <laughs> this wonderful boulevard. Pass Rito and King Edward straightens out. Canada's coffee shop, Tim Hortons, the Shepherds of Good Hope, a francophone theater, a city pool. But by far, the most interesting looking building in the area is the once and former synagogue. Three stories of red brick. Starting from the top, you see two large domes. They're onion shaped, a feature common in mosques and Eastern Orthodox churches, but totally different from the Gothic spires and steeples of Western churches, which dominate Ottawa. Next, you might notice the windows, square at the bottom and round at the top. This is a popular motif with synagogues. It's supposed to look like the Ten Commandments. The top is a newer addition. If you look closely, you could see a Star of David in the high circular window. There are two more on the doors. The style is Romanesque revival. This is meant to look different than everything else around it. This is a Jewish synagogue. The arched entrance with the gradual and gentle brick corbelling is inviting you. Come inside. You enter the front door. Left and right are two staircases. You go forward and enter the sanctuary and the ceiling opens up. It feels vast and grand. Vaulted soft white ceilings with warm, deep brown trusses running parallel front to back. Hanging from the ceiling, you see beautiful, ornate lanterns 
each pane etched with the Star of David. From the back, behind you and above, is the second floor balcony, made of steel banisters and wooden columns. This is where women used to sit, above the praying men in the main sanctuary. That was my first shul, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was a little wee kid, and you came into the shul, and women were upstairs in the gallery. The gallery's upstairs. We were upstairs on the left. My, my whole life, my, or, or her whole life, my mother was always ladies left. I think that's really funny. And I just automatically, when I go to shul, I go to what was ladies left. It's, it's a uh, ladies left. So if you look at the shul, the front of the shul is here. So you go up to the gallery. The gallery is all around this way. And so the, the gallery is up above. The, my mother was up here. My father was down here on the other side. And so if you were on, you, you had to have men and women on opposite sides or else you could never see each other because they would signal to each other like. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so you had to have some, some way of communicating because he's down there and she's up here. The force of the room, the layout of the benches, the dramatic opening of the balconies to the east or the morning light pours in through the stained glass windows towards Jerusalem. This is where the Torah, the Jewish holy scrolls, used to sit. Canada was different back in the late 1800s. Jews were left out of many professions due to general poverty, quotas, and restrictions at universities. The most popular profession was peddling, getting a cart, filling it with fruit, trinkets, and whatever else you could find, and pushing it through the mud. In Toronto, a peddling license cost $5, $25 with a mule. In Montreal, it ranged from 40 to 60. But in Ottawa, it was cheap. It was 25 cents for 10 days. With the cheapest peddling license, out of all the major cities, Jews began to pour into Ottawa. The Adaf Jeshurun congregation was formed in 1892. For years prior, families would pack into the home of A.J. and Lillian Friedman for prayer, high holidays, and communal meals. They used to, they used to meet in people's houses. They didn't really have a building. For a long time, they just met in people's houses. They used to have big houses because they had big families, so they had big houses. And so they would have services in people's houses. In 1895, the small congregation bought, as their first place of worship, a small wooden building in the Byward Market on Murray Street. The building they chose, however, was located right next to a food processing plant whose staple product was, of all products, pork and beans. Think about that. The air in the synagogue actually smelled like pork. This didn't fly. As Jews moved to Ottawa and the congregation and community grew, the leaders were finally able to move the group into a larger building in a better location. In 1904, the synagogue finalized plans for a new building on King Edward Avenue. So, who are the founders? First of all, we have Moses Bilski. Bilski was actually the first Jew in all of Ottawa. If you're from Ottawa, maybe you've heard this name. Moses was born in Lithuania in 1892 and moves to Montreal at the tender age of 14. Around the age of 28, he moves to Ottawa, and according to family lore, he witnesses the laying of the stones of the first parliament building. Around the age of 30, he starts getting some Ottawa-induced cabin fever and skips town for the caribou in British Columbia to join in the gold rush. From there, Moses somehow gets conned into a gun smuggling operation in Panama. It doesn't look great, but he manages to find what may have been the only Jew in the area who helps him to escape. Now, the canal was only completed in 1914, so Moses Bilski had to travel down the Atlantic, sail under the tip of South America, and sail back up to the Pacific, where he was smuggled into the United States. He lands in California in 1865, right at the tail end of the American Civil War. So what does he do? Train home to Ottawa and recover from the gun smuggling South American adventure? No. He gets recruited into the Union and fights in the Civil War. Then he gets wounded. You know, because of the Civil War. And finally returns home to Ottawa where he settles down. He takes a brief weekend trip to New York, finds a marriage worthy lady, brings her back up to Ottawa, opens a pawn shop, and finally becomes a founding member of our own Adath Jeshurun congregation. 
Reverend Jacob Mursky. Side note, although now the term reverend is a pretty good hint that we're talking about Christianity, it was once a term used in the Jewish faith, and sometimes it still is. It refers to someone who, like Jacob Mursky, has a rabbinic role, but has not achieved smicha, so he's technically not a rabbi. Anyway, Mursky was born in Russia and in the 1890s immigrated to New York and enrolled in a seminary. When Moses Bilski travels to New York to find a bride, he picks up Jacob too and along with a few Sefer Torahs brings them back to Ottawa to begin work as a Dath Jeshurun's first cantor. For 23 years, not only did Mursky sing traditional music, but he also composed his own. And we still have it. In 1998, Carleton University published an issue of Canadian musical heritage included one of Jacob Mursky's composition entitled Adam Yusod Miofor. His personal style was traditional and his voice is said to have been sweet and gentle. AJ and Lillian Freeman were there too. These two were Ottawa's original Jewish power couple. Lillian was Moses Bilski's fifth child, born in Ottawa, and AJ was born in Lithuania. He moved to Ottawa for business and in 1903 he married Lillian. They were regulars in Zionism, philanthropy, community involvement. While AJ ran his store on Rideau Street, Lillian bounced back and forth between home and city hall, running fundraisers, feeding the homeless, and caring for the sick. She started the Poppy Campaign for Veterans that has become a Canadian iconic tradition. She also ran a campaign to rescue 146 Jewish orphans from the Ukraine and personally saw each of them placed in adopted homes across Canada. She was the first Jewish woman and the first Jewish Canadian to be awarded the Order of the British Empire. A.J. Freeman also had his claim to social justice fame. A.J. was very instrumental. So in A.J. is a member of your family. Yeah. He was the AJ, son-in-law of Moses Bilski. That's mar correct. Married the fifth daughter. That's and correct. And he was like a successful businessman. And he, helped. he was a very successful businessman. So these two were used to advocating on the front lines for human rights for veterans, orphans, homeless, and Jews. It's no surprise that they would be heavily involved in the founding of Ottawa's first synagogue. And there's a wonderful story about him that most people don't know about, which has to do with anti-Semitism in the 30s. And there was a um, French-Canadian uh, Police policeman officer. in Quebec. Yeah, a policeman. And there was this whole thing about getting people not to shop at a Jewish store. And A.J., because he had both the money and at that time, I would say the courage, he took him to court and he won. And that was a landmark. Nobody had ever done that before. So let's get back to the 1800s. It's 1895 and Moses and our crew are sitting down to arrange their new non-pork smelling synagogue in Ottawa. They buy the land and they hire award-winning architect J.W.H. Watts, an English immigrant who worked for the chief architect of the Department of Public Works. By the way, you can still see this guy's work all over town. Besides a daft gesture, he designed the interior fittings of the Library of Parliament, a gasometer for Rideau Hall, and a 50-foot arch in Parliament Square to mark the arrival of the Marc de Lorne, Canada's fourth Governor General, in 1878. He also specialized in private houses for wealthy families. Construction for the building was completed in 1904. It cost the congregation a whopping $12,000. Later, in 1930, the congregation renovated the building and added an extra top piece to hide its pitched roof. In 1956, Adath Jeshurun amalgamated with another synagogue, Agud Ithachim, to form the Beth Shalom congregation. Adath Jeshurun's building was then converted to form the Hevra Kedisha, the Jewish Community Memorial Chapel. If you've noticed in older pictures that the building looks slightly different from today, you're correct. When the building was converted into a Hevra Kedisha, whose function is to provide funeral services, the building's main entrance had to be altered from two smaller doors to one big one in order to allow the passage of caskets in and out of the building. The building functioned as a Hever Kadisha until its sale to a Seven Days Adventist church in 1997. Yes, Adath Jeshurun was the first established synagogue in town. And yes, the King Edward building was their first permanent location. But think about its location in terms of its surroundings. 
is strategically located in the heart of the Byward Market and in Lower Town, an immigrant neighborhood that combined French, English, and Jewish families. By situating their building in such a busy part of town, the Jews of Ottawa were making a statement to their neighbors and themselves on who they intended to be. The legacies of Moses Bilski, Jacob Mursky, and Lillian and A.J. Friedman may be extraordinary, but their beginnings were perfectly average. In fact, most of the community's backgrounds were from the same place in Eastern Europe, in what was then called the Pale of Settlement. From 1791 until 1915, the majority of Jews in Eastern Europe were forced into one territory in Tsarist Russia and made to live in small, poor villages known as shtetls. The Pale covered around one million square kilometers and was home to almost five million Jews. And the law not only restricted movement, but also occupation. Jews were forbidden to work in any area outside of commerce and craft. And by the time the 20th century rolled around, competition was so fierce and anti-Semitism and pogroms had become so dangerous that between 1881 and 1906, there was a near constant stream of immigration into the United States and Canada. In building a death gesture room where they did, these Jewish pioneers were announcing themselves as citizens of Ottawa, participating in a new nation-building project and proudly being Jewish. They built their shul right downtown where everyone would notice them. And they were noticeable. Members of Adath Jeshurun established themselves as important business people, participants in community projects all over town. When A.J. Friedman died, the Hever Kadisha was overflowing with Jews and non-Jews alike. When my father died, my father died in 1969, and I, there are things that my father, my father died so suddenly that it was a, an incredible shock. But one of the things I remember is coming out and the people just covered King Edward Avenue. There were, there were people, the whole building was full. People were standing all around the edges and people were all down the steps, all across King Edward to the other side. It was just this mass of people. His impact on the city was that huge. Ottawa offered this community something remarkable, a chance to fully engage with their Jewish identities, while at the same time participate in the building of their city as equal citizens. They moved to a town where they were socialized and worked with Francophones and Anglophones and became more than just a minority. Now, the Jewish community of Adath Jeshurun has moved on. They have mostly left Lower Town. As their dreams have gotten bigger, they've spread out to different areas of the city. They've established new synagogues to suit their diverse and changing needs. But they have left the legacy of where they came from. Adath Jeshurun, even now, is the perfect symbol of that legacy. And by the way, Jewish institutions downtown remain. Walk through the Bywood Market and you can still see many Jewish merchants and families working the same stands their grandparents started. Now, almost as a way of paying it forward, Adath Jeshurun has come into the hands of a new immigrant community, French, African, and Caribbean immigrants. Founding Jewish Ottawans planted a seed in a death jeshurun, and their new tiny shul allowed them to grow that seed into something much bigger, something that we will continue to explore in the next episode of 613 Archives, the Ottawa Jewish Archives podcast. Six one three archives has been brought to you by the Ottawa Jewish Archives and was made possible through the generosity of the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society. I am your host, Jimmy Gutman. This episode was written by Zoe Thrumston and me, and produced by Zoe and Josh, so-called Dolgan, who also created the theme music. If you want to berate us or tell us how great we are, find the Ottawa Jewish Archives on Facebook or go to jewishottawa.com forward slash Ottawa dash Jewish dash archives. Pictures from the archives that correspond to this episode are also available on our Facebook page. Go check them out and see you next time.